what I'm going to be talking about is a real treasure of the Bodleian Library, but one that was very recently acquired. Uh, in fact, the, these are two maps that are from a treatise of Ayum, whose very existence, much less its contents, were unknown until the manuscript came up for sale at Christie's in 2000. We were, the Bodleian was able to acquire that manuscript through the very generous support from the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund, the National Arts Collections Fund, of course the Friends of the Bodleian Library, Saudi Aramco, a number of colleges here in Oxford contributed to the costs as well as some individuals as well. And the result was that this quite remarkable volume came into the collection here. And it contains an enormous amount of completely unique material and gives us an insight into the medieval world, particularly travel and trade and cartography, that we did not have before. Now, the volume, from which these are two maps, uh, is a, essentially, it is a, an 11th century Egyptian guide to the universe. That is, it's a guide to the heavens and to the earth. It's in two books, one on the heavens, one on the earth. We don't know the author's name, but we do know from material that he gives us in the text, and there's an enormous amount of text that, around these maps, that he was working in Egypt between 1020 and 1050 AD. We also know that he was very widely read because he provides us with a great deal of both text and visual material that is not preserved otherwise in any context. Uh, but the treatise he wrote is not a technical treatise. It was a treatise addressed to the general learned, literate public, you might say. Uh, it is really what you might call a reader's digest guide to the universe in that you have an enormous amount of information but no technical detail. Uh, it is rather, it is a treatise of the sort that a, a, an ambitious bureaucrat in the middle of the 11th century in Egypt would very much have, have wanted because this material would provide you with excellent information to impress a patron or your dinner party guests that you wished uh, to impress that you knew everything there was about the heavens and the earth. It should be remembered, of course, that at the time he composed this, uh, there were no telescopes. So the, the book that is concerned with the heavens has only those planets, five planets, in fact, that are visible to the naked eye. Uh, in the case of the book of the, uh, this book on the earth, which is these two come from, um, it should be remembered that they knew the earth was spherical. They, they, he, in fact, he gives an account of the uh, correction of the calculations for the circumference of the Earth. Uh, he opens his book on the Earth with that. Uh, it is a modern myth that people in the Middle Ages thought the Earth was flat. They did not. They knew it to be spherical. He then proceeds from uh, in the book on the Earth uh, to talk about different parts of the then known inhabited Earth. Of course, they didn't, although they knew the Earth to be spherical, they did not know the New World, and nor did they know anything about the southern portion of, the, of Africa. Uh, in the course of his discussion, he has provided us with 17 maps. And of those 17 maps in the book on the Earth, 14 of those are completely unique to this manuscript and they provide us with a very different view of what people knew, people living on the southern rim of the Mediterranean, knew of Europe, of Asia, and particularly of the eastern Mediterranean. Now, what we have here is a rectangular world map, and this was what first attracted historians to this manuscript. All world maps prior to this time this is 10, 20, 10, 50, um, were circular, and they had only regional names on them, only re with the possible exception of Jerusalem. This map has 395 city names on it. That in itself is 
a huge change in the approach to making world maps. And it has a grid across the top. And this is the, early, the only map that we have with a grid. Gra uh, graticule is a technical term for that, uh, prior to the European Renaissance. Now, we know from other materials, textual materials, that in Baghdad, in the 9th century and 10th century, they were making plotted maps, plotted by latitude and longitude. But we have had none of those. This is the first evidence that we have of that physical evidence of that activity. However, this particular map is a bit confusing in that he's superimposed, our author, two approaches to making a map. One that is plotted and an earlier one from the 10th century that is very abstract. So it's difficult to uh, work out what he's doing here exactly. This is Spain. This parachute-like effect is the, the origin of the Nile. They're called the Mountains of the Moon. And you can see it going down, and that's the Nile Delta. So we have North Africa up here. South is at the top. Uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And this is a combined uh, India and China, and bits of China. And this is, represents the easternmost limit of the inhabitable world, they thought at the time. Uh, and Constantinople is here with a bit of a uh, wall shown there. These river systems, very straight, very abstract, those are from a different system of mapping from the 10th century that he sort of superimposed on a larger map that was at one time plotted. But it's very exciting in terms of the history of cartography, and this alone would make this manuscript a treasure. But this is only one of 14 completely unique maps in this, and I haven't even mentioned the illustrations of star patterns, star diagrams, comets, all sorts of other illustrations that are, again, unique in terms of our uh, preserved material. Um, amongst the other unique maps, we have the earliest recorded map of Sicily. This is the island of Sicily, before, of course, the Norman invasion. It provides, the, all of his maps are really platforms for texts as well. So it provides a great deal of information about new gates that are being uh, built, uh, some new lands. Uh, there is information on here that allows you, you really see the author living at one particular time because he talks about a particular gate having just been constructed three years earlier and so on. Um, it's very important again in the history of cartography. Our man was very well informed about the primary commercial triangle of the first half of the 11th century. And that triangle went from Sicily, before the Norman invasion, to Tunis, which was a village in the Nile Delta, which was completely destroyed in the Crusades in 1221. When our man was working, it was the major center for textile production for the entire southern Mediterranean rim. Very important, and he provided us for this for Tunis, again, a two-page map of the city of, of Tunis, which is very valuable since the city is now of a, uh, just simply a ruin. Uh, he also provided a, another map of the third part of the triangle, which was a city called Mahdia in present-day Tunisia. Uh, Tunisia. Um, and that triangle really was the major uh, uh, commercial triangle of the day. He also provides a map of the Mediterranean that simply, it, it's rather, it's shocking its simplicity because it's all circles and ovals, masses of information, and he writes off Muslim Spain. He simply has a little a label on to the left saying the ports of Al-Andalus. And then he says the ports of the Franks, the ports of the Lombards, and then everything else on the map begins, concerns only the Eastern Mediterranean. And again, he provides us with information about the Eastern Mediterranean and travel in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean that we had no idea uh, they would have known about. I feel that it is 
ex wa is and was extremely important that a manuscript of this importance comes into a library so that it can be used by, a, uh, by scholars throughout the world. I uh, felt uh, very strongly about this when we were trying to raise money for the Bodleian to acquire this. Because for it to go into a, a private collection, limits the availability of that uh, manuscript for general use. Also, by coming into the Bodleian, we were able to make use of the remarkable con uh, conservation uh, studio here, which uh, you, we would not have had access to. You can bring in scholars from around the world. And, and when this came into the Bodleian, many scholars on their own came here to examine it and to uh, test its uh, authenticity. Because it contains so much entirely new material, uh, scholars often thought, well, it must not be genuine. So there were, there, uh, again, being in a library, like we could encourage people to come in and examine the paper structures. We, again, the library spent uh, good funds having the, the pigments uh, examined and uh, uh, tested. Um, and um, it has passed every single uh, test we can throw at it in terms of its uh, legitimacy um, and, and genuineness. Um, and you couldn't, if it remained in a private collection, um, it, it would not reach the scholars and the public, and it would not be as uh, thoroughly analyzed and tested as we have been able to do uh, with it here in the Bodleian. Right. Why do we call it the Book of Well, one of the things I thought maybe we could have a title page, but we don't. Um, it's titled in Arabic, Gararib al Fuyun wa Muhal al means, well, it's an internally rhyming Arabic title. And in, at this time, the titles in Arabic were often very playful that way and would include rhyming. And it's very difficult to uh, render it properly into English. But a fair translation is the Book of Curiosities of the Sciences and Marvels for the Eyes. Uh, obviously, we shortened that to the Book of Curiosities because it makes it much easier to refer to it. Um, uh, such a title, again, uh, well, it, it shows that the author intended the reader of this treatise to be filled with marvel and uh, uh, surprise at the um, at the creation of the, of the universe and, and of the uh, acts of God. So it's a, it's a very typical um, medieval title, really.